Nothing, nothing drives a sound man crazier than to stand up there and go, sorry. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've had a chance to be up here and, and, and share the Word of God with you, and I'm really glad to be here today, and I'm glad to see so many of you here. Um, and this is a sermon that uh, is really important to me. I'm really excited to be sharing this particular sermon with you. Um, tell you what I mean is uh, that this sermon has taken me 30 years to write. I can promise you it won't take me that long to preach it, okay? <laughs> and let me tell you what I mean. <laughs> um, as a new Christian, I was uh, intent on learning why the Bible was so important. So what I did was I eagerly read it. I consumed the Bible beginning with Genesis 1. And there were so many things that I found in the scripture that just amazed me. Right from the start, the thing that most amazed me was how God chose to interact with his creation. I mean, he walked in the garden with Adam, and he graciously kept covenant with Noah. And through Abraham, he chose a people upon which to pour out his love and his grace, and through which he was to restore a fallen world. There was, this, uh, there was this consistency that I found uh, in God's character, and it was demonstrated by how he related to us, his precious children. But I didn't get that far when my desire to plow through the scripture um, just skidded to a stop. And all of that changed for me when I read Genesis 22. See, in Genesis 22, as Joe shared with us, God calls Abraham to climb Mount Moriah with his beloved son and to offer him up as a sacrifice. I thought, what? God demanded that Abraham kill his own son? How could God do that? What, what if God demanded something like this of me after I had walked with him for a while. I thought, how was it possible that my new Christian brothers and sisters, uh, many of whom had been walking for God, with God for many, many years, how was it possible that these people could accept this account and continue on praising God for his love, for his grace, praising God for his mercy? And I learned... I learned that just as Abraham, just as he lifts that knife above Isaac, it seems that there are many Christians who seem to reach for scissors, at least mentally. They want to pull a, a, a Thomas Jefferson, and they want to sort of snip that story out of their Bibles. I mean, in Genesis 22, God commands Abraham to sacrifice, to kill his beloved son. And many conclude that this surely is an embarrassment to our modern sensibilities, that it's an affront to our common humanity. And I recall thinking that this account was an unbridgeable barrier to faith for any right-minded inquirer. I mean, how could it not be? Um, any of you have heard me preach before, you know that I often refer to my favorite contemporary prophet, Bob Dylan. And uh, Bob Dylan did not leave us without some wisdom on this topic as well. In fact, in uh, Highway 61 Revisited, he begins his song like this. He said, and I won't sing it, I'll save you that. He said, Oh, God said to Abraham, kill me a son. And Abe says, man, you must be putting me on. And God say no. And Abe say what? Well, here's the thing. What isn't Abraham's response in the Bible? But I really think that Dylan did an amazing job putting the words my alarm. Man, you must be putting me on. I mean, what in the name of God are we to do with this chapter? So I'm going to ask you today to work with me as we go through uh, Genesis 22. And Joe did a wonderful job reading that. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate your staying on task. I will tell you, just a little aside, Joe and I were texting each other last night. And uh, he told me, he, I, he said, who's preaching tomorrow? I said, I am. Does this mean you're not coming? He said, I'm obligated. I got to read the scripture. 
I said, what scripture are you reading? He said, Genesis 22, 1 through 19. I said, what a coincidence. That's what I'm preaching on, you know? And he said, well, I may change it up. <laughs> so thank you, Joe, for sticking. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us through it. And Father, I thank you that even when we come to those places that leave us scratching our head, that there is a way through. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at this scripture before us today, that we're able to uh, get past the things that offend us and find out, find who you are, find who we are through you. So I ask, Lord, for you to bless us today by opening this scripture in our minds and our hearts. I pray this in your name for your glory, in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Well, you know, there's much that we can glean from this passage. And I think that so that we may truly, truly understand its meaning, we need to consider it from uh, several different perspectives. And initially, what I want to suggest to you is that we should try to experience this drama as Abraham did. We should sh seek to share Abraham's perspective. So what we want to do is seek a sandals on the ground view of what's going on here. And, and what I want to suggest to you is that on the surface, the story is almost too fantastic to believe. I mean, in a nutshell, Abraham is this guy who is well past 100 years old. And how do we know this? We know this because in Genesis 17, um, the scripture tells us that Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And although we do not have an explicit age for either Abraham or Isaac in Genesis 22, um, we get a clue because in Genesis 22, we know that Isaac is old enough to climb the mountain and it climb that mountain burdened with the wood for the sacrifice, right? So I'm confident, and I would suggest to you that uh, then Isaac was in the neighborhood of 20, give or take a few years. And what that means, of course, is that Abraham was in the neighborhood of 120 years. So what we're reading is that at the ripe old age of 120 years old, God calls Abraham to journey three days up Mount Moriah and to offer his son up as a sacrifice. Let's begin with verses 1 and 2. Um, it's in, in verse 1, now, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, and listen to this, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And then here's where the madness begins. Let's consider Abraham's response to that that we find in verse 3. So the scripture says, so Abraham, and listen to this, he rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey and he took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and went to the place which God had told him. See, Abraham doesn't respond as in Dylan's song. He doesn't say, man, you must be putting me on. He saddles his donkey and sets out to travel three days to kill his son. Was he insane? Was he hearing voices? What's going on here? Now, let me give you a little bit of context. I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with this story, right? Sarah, Isaac's mother, was 90 years old before she became a mother for the first time and gave birth to him. So that after a lifetime of being barren, she now had a son. And I cannot imagine that Isaac was anything except for the very apple of her eye, the apex of her universe, the center of her world. So what I want you to do now with that context is I want you to kind of hypothetically, you know, again, sandals on the ground. I want you to peel back the, the curtains and peek in on an imaginary conversation the night before Abraham and Isaac's journey to Mount Moriah began. What do you think occurred that night before the trip? I mean, in my mind, I can picture Abraham, you know, he's sitting at the supper table, you know, um, maybe he's passing the potatoes around, and he says to Sarah, he says, Sarah, might you pack up some leftovers? You know, the boy and I, 
are going to go on a trip to Mount Moriah. And perhaps, you know, Sarah's sitting there putting some salt on the lima beans, and she, she says to him, you know, that sounds just lovely. I hear Mount Moriah is beautiful this time of year. And, and some quality father and son time, well, that's always fun. When can I expect you boys back? And I picture Abraham, you know, he looks kind of uncomfortable, you know, and he puts his hand up so that Isaac can't see his answer. And he quietly says to her, I'll be back in six days. But the boy, well, I'm going to sacrifice him to God. God says that would be a good idea. But let's keep that our little secret, okay? Do you really think Sarah would have replied, oh, okay, sure. Do you think that would have happened? I mean, perhaps Abraham lied to Sarah and to his son Isaac. Perhaps he did not tell them the true reason for the journey. But if that were true, how might Abraham explain Isaac's conspicuous absence when he returned? Sarah asked, where's Isaac? Well, funny thing happened on the way to Mount Moriah. See, God told me that it would be a good idea to offer him up as a sacrifice. What else could I do but I would pay? Come on, folks. If you believe that, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous in any context, in any setting. If you are of the opinion that Abraham, the father of Israel, that he blindly sought to obey, to obey this seemingly arbitrary test of his commitment to God and agreed to actions that would end with his beloved son dying by his hand on Mount Moriah, then you must come to terms with the extent of this deception that he perpetrated. He would have had to lie to his wife, Sarah. He would have to lie to his son, Isaac. He would have to lie to his servants. And if, we were to on if he were to honestly inform all of these confidants of this plan to obediently sacrifice his son, don't you think at least one of them would have tried to stop him? Don't you think Isaac, a young man who was in his 20s, would have perhaps run away? I mean, what would you do if a crazy old man who happened to be your father calmly told you that he was going to kill you because God told him to do so? There's a problem here. Now, let's set aside Abraham's predicament and what we learn about Abraham if he was seeking to obey God. Because I think we're faced with an even more terrifying question. What do we learn about God's character if he was testing Abraham's obedience with this demand to kill his son? What do we learn about God's character? Now, turn again with me to Genesis 22.1, and let's see what we can establish here. What are we to make of God's test of Abraham then? See, Genesis 22.1 says, Now it came to pass that after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. So the point is that this clearly is a test. It's clearly a test. But is it a story of Abraham's obedience tested? You know, the Muslims believe so. The Muslims believe that this is all about Abraham's obedience. In fact, one of the main uh, times of celebration in the Muslim, Muslim calendar year is the feast of Eid al-Adha. And this fe festival commemorates the blind obedience of the holy prophet Abraham showing in his willingness to sacrifice his son to Allah. Friends, does that terrify anyone other than me? Does it scare you that a people would celebrate a father's willingness to kill his own son? Listen, I mean, even when my sons were teenagers, although I confess to sometimes being tempted, I would not have offered any of them up as a sacrifice. Does it scare you that God, our loving father, would ask his faithful servant to choose between his son that he loved and God? Does that scare you? I mean, if this is true, if this is true, that this is a story about Abraham's obedience, how does it change your picture of what a godly father should be? How does it change your picture of what God the Father is? If it is a story about Abraham's obedience, even to the point of killing his own son, then friends, I'm going to tell you this is scandalous. It flies in the face of everything that I've been taught about being a father, about being a Christian, and about God, my father. 
It's scandalous to celebrate a father willing to commit filicide to, in obedience to a capricious God who on a whim can say, Abraham, you really love your son, but show me that you love me more and kill him. Show me that you will obey me, even if it costs your son's life, your wife's love, and your community's respect. Let me tell you, I had one son who was approaching his fourth birthday when I first read this story, when I first read Genesis 22. And I remember it well because at that time I was living in the back of an army truck in, in the middle of a seemingly endless stretch of desert in Saudi Arabia. It was 1990, and my country had sent me to this godforsaken corner of the world uh, to protect it from Saddam Hussein. And, and, and I had made peace with the likelihood that I wasn't going to live to see my young son again. And it grieved me. I won't lie to you. It grieved me when I thought about all of the experiences that I had hoped to share with him. I thought about the wisdom that I wanted to impart to him. I thought about all the milestones that I would miss. At, you know, his first success riding a bike, his, his, his first day of kindergarten, you know, maybe securing his driver's license, graduating from high school, perhaps even becoming a father himself someday. And I felt this heaviness in my heart when I thought about the possibility of him growing up without me. You know, he, he had so much potential and he was the hope of my legacy. So here I was sitting in the middle of this desert and I was, had these thoughts in my heart and um, I read this passage from scripture and I looked at the only picture that I had of my son. And I thought to myself, now, I knew in my heart that if God were to ask me to prove my obedience by sacrificing my son, that I could not do it. I would not do it. In fact, I can say I would rather be cast in the hell for all eternity than take my son's life. Is there a father out here who wouldn't say the same thing? See, even then, at the beginning of my walk with God, I sensed there had to be more to this account. It could not be about a man who would prove his obedience by murdering his son. And I remember praying that God would never test me that way because I knew that that was one test I could not pass. So this is not a narrative about being willing to, Abraham willingly being obedient to, in killing his son at the whim of an arbitrary God. And if that's the case, how do we explain it? Well, it's not a tale of obedience. Let me offer you another perspective. What if God was not testing Abraham's obedience, but testing Abraham's faith? instead. Okay, what if God was not testing Abraham's obedience, but testing Abraham's faith instead? Now, I think before we can, you know, in order to get a handle on that question, the first thing that we have to do is define faith. What is faith? The author of Hebrews defines faith this way. In Hebrews 11, uh, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then if you drop down in Hebrews 11 to verses 8 through 12, we read about how the author of Hebrews identifies Abraham as one of the fathers of our faith. And here's what he writes. He says, by faith, not obedience, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars in the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. 
So here's what I want to do. Um, let's see if we can identify with Abraham when we consider his faith in God, not his obedience to God. See, if Abraham knew God, if Abraham knew God's character, might he have reason to offer his son on Mount Moriah's altar? And let me show you what I mean. I want you to turn back a few chapters to Genesis 17, where we read this. When Abraham was 99 years, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, Abram, but your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Drop down to verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. A son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Here's the point. It's really important that you see this. Abraham knew God. He had a relationship with God. He knew that God could be trusted. So some 20 years before Abraham took Isaac up on that mountain, God made a covenant with Abraham. And God promised that through Abraham's seed, that is through the promised child of his old age, that God was going to deliver three things. First, Abraham would be the father of a great people, a multitude, a multitude of people, people more numerous than the sand on the shore or the stars on the sky, a multitude of people. Friends, that's a lot of people. Second, God promised Abraham that his people would own the land through which nomadic Abraham traveled. And third, all of creation would be blessed through him. All of these covenant promises then would be fulfilled through Isaac. Okay, here's the point. This God who was testing Abraham had proved worthy of Abraham's faith. Can you see that? God had miraculously made Sarah the mother of Isaac at the age of 90. Then God made certain promises through Isaac. See, Isaac was the promised one. He was the one through whom all of these covenant promises would come true. And Abraham had, through experience, learned that God was faithful and that God was worthy of his faith. Now, we get to chapter 22, and in chapter 22, God is testing Abraham's faith. And the question that Abraham called, was called to resolve was this. Did Abraham have sufficient reason, based on what God had already done in his life, to trust God? That was the question. And I'm certain... Listen, I have no doubt that when God told Abraham to take his son up on the mountain and sacrifice him, that Abraham was filled with terror at the thought of that. And, and, but I'm equally sure, I'm equally sure that Abraham knew beyond any doubt that God would somehow be faithful to the promises that he had made through Isaac. See, God could not make Abraham the father of a great people if Isaac died. In and through his faith, Abraham knew that somehow Isaac would walk back down that mountain with him. Abraham knew that God could indeed raise Isaac back up from the dead if Abraham had to go so far as to plunge his knife 
into his son's chest. Abraham knew that somehow God would be faithful to his promises and that Isaac would live and that those promises would be brought to fruition. So now when we examine this account through the lens of faith and not the lens of obedience, we can better understand what was behind some of the, the, the limited dialogue captured by Scripture. You know, in verse 7, we read of Isaac questioning his father. In verse 7, it says, But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went and listen, this is a very important word. They went together. See, Abraham's not lying to Isaac when he says God will provide for himself the lamb. Abraham's not lying to him. He's not tricking him. And I think that we have room to see that there may have been um, more conversation than then that would, you know, followed Isaac's question. And I can easily see Abraham sharing the reason, the true reason for the visit to Mount Moriah. And I can see Isaac even agreeing to be offered up on that altar because based on their personal experience with this God, they proceeded in faith. They proceeded in faith. So instead of this story being couched in lies and deception, what we now find is a family that's intimately familiar with God. We find that their faith is sufficient based on past experience to justify Abraham's binding of his son. We find that Abraham was not a madman when he laid his son on the altar and raised that knife above his head so that he could plunge it into his son's chest. And here's what's even more interesting. If you look at this through this lens of faith, Isaac was not a victim of a capricious or insane father. He was a willing participant. The mystery concern why Isaac didn't run away is explained. Isaac was complicit. He may have been afraid of how events might transpire, but he knew that his life was not going to end up there on that mountain, on that altar. You know, I can picture it. When I think about this drama unfolding, I can picture the anxiety growing with each second that passed as Abraham and Isaac trudged up that mountain together. And I have to believe that during that long walk up that mountain that both Abraham and Isaac were wondering, how was God going to orchestrate events such that Isaac would walk back down that mountain? And I can imagine that each passing moment must have brought a new level of anxiety, a new level of doubt. Each click of the sundial must have seemed like eternity. See, I never watch it. It's sundials. Sundials. Okay. Never mind. So, sure, they were confident in God's covenant promises, but they were fearful of the unknown immediate future. Who hasn't experienced that? Does that sound familiar to anyone? I mean, has it ever happened to you? God, I know your plan is good, and I know that you love me, but God, I have cancer. God, I know that you will never leave me and that you will always provide, but God, I just lost my job. How am I going to feed my kids? That's the world that we live in, folks. But finally, Abraham and Isaac, they reach the top of that mountain. And I picture Abe, Isaac standing there. And I picture him struggling to, to, to swallow his fear as he allows his father to bind him. And I can picture Abraham as he's tying up Isaac, you know. His binding had to be tight enough to restrain him. But Abraham did not want to inflict pain on his son. And I can see Isaac then. He's lying on the altar. And then supported by quivering knees, the old man lifts that knife above his head and he's barely these knees are barely able to hold them upright and Isaac probably is laying there with his eyes closed and both of them had to be thinking okay God what are you waiting for what are you waiting for and then we know the rest of the story right the scripture tells us that on the mountain God provided the lamb for the sacrifice God provided the lamb now, before we turn from this powerful narrative, um, I want to make a few points of application. And I challenge you to ask yourself these questions. Here's the first one. Upon what is your faith in God built? 
And I want to suggest a framework for that answer. First, we have something available to us that Abraham did not have available to him. We have the Bible, right? We have God's word. We know um, that on every page of this Bible that God reveals himself to his people And we know that God is faithful because we have a sacred history of his faithful acts for his people. So that's the first thing we know. We have God's word. Abraham didn't have that. Here's the second point. Like Abraham, every believer should have his own personal experience with this God who saves. Every believer should have his own personal experience with this God who saves. Here's what I'm saying. Consider your testimony. Under what circumstances did you encounter God? What has God done in your life or the life of those who you know and love? Is that sufficient to give you faith? Okay, let's go on. Um, Up to this point, we have considered this account from a sandals-on-the-ground approach, and we have attempted to place ourselves there personally, witnessing as this drama unfolds. And we first considered the account through the lens of obedience, and we found the message lacking when considered through that lens. We stumbled over inconsistencies in Abraham's character and God's character. Then we changed the lens and we considered the account through the lens of faith. And we stood with Abraham and we looked down at Isaac, bound and afraid on that altar. And we discovered that because of faith built upon experience with a faithful God, that we could discover grounds upon which to relate and to understand Abraham and Isaac. Now, what I want to do is I want to challenge you to, this, to, to, to see this story through yet one more perspective. I want you to see it through now through the lens of history, okay? Um, I think it should be obvious that I just love Genesis 22, and it is perhaps my favorite chapter in all the Bible. You know, when I read this, I don't want to get out the scissors. I want to get out the magnifying glass because when we train our eyes to see what's there, this chapter becomes not a barrier to our faith, but an almighty boost to our faith. But we need to begin with some basics, okay? So we begin with a simple question. What is the Bible? Um, I think it's true that sometimes Christians are the worst at answering this question. And I'm guessing that uh, many of you may have heard some of these replies. So, the, you know, have you ever heard, you know, what is the Bible? And some will tell you it's the maker's instruction manual. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah? Yeah. Um, or maybe you've heard that it's God's roadmap. Yeah? Um, there's some creative types who have even given us an acronym, Bible, B-I-B-L-E, stands for Basic Instructions before leaving earth. Anybody ever heard that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, often people, whether they're Christian or not, they essentially see the Bible as a moral guidebook. But friends, here's what I want to tell you. If we read Genesis 22 through this lens of morality, we're in for a shock. When God says, sacrifice your son, how should we react? Should we go and do likewise? Definitely not. I mean, you all knew that, right? That was the answer there. Definitely not. Okay, good. Um, If we copied or endorsed each practice in the Bible, especially this this practice of child sacrifice, man, we'd be in a terrible mess, not to mention likely in prison. So let's go back to Genesis 22-2 again. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Well, as we've already discussed, we are shocked by this verse. But to the attentive reader, it's actually more shocking, not less, because, you see, we know who Isaac is. He's the offspring of Abraham. He's the hope of the world. Through Isaac will come all of God's blessings to all of the nations. And now God wants him slain as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice of atonement, if you will. Apparently, apparently the way God will save the world is through a beloved son offered up on a mountain. 
And I want you to notice something, too, that this mountain is in the region of Moriah. If you look in 2 Chronicles 3, 1, it tells us that Mount Moriah will, in fact, become the temple mount in Jerusalem. Huh. I see a dim light coming on as I look out from up here. <laughs> Listen. Abraham's faith shines through this chapter. I think we've established that. And he reassures Isaac, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. What he's telling him is that somehow a substitute will be provided. Somehow God will offer the lamb and everything will be okay. Because Abraham knows that Isaac is the promised one. That he is the hope of the world. So whatever happens, whatever happens up there on that mountain, Isaac will make it through. As we saw in Hebrews 11, Abraham has this resurrection-shaped faith. Now, on this occasion on the mountain, a ram is provided. A ram is provided. And I think that that may suggest that the lamb is yet future. So this whole episode concludes, Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it'll be provided. That's Genesis twenty-two fourteen. 14. And I want you to notice the future tense in that scripture. God will provide. And what will he provide? He'll provide the Lamb of God, the offspring of Abraham, the beloved son, the hope of the world. One day on that very mountain, God would provide the ultimate atonement. And many who over the millennia followed Abraham, they knew it for centuries afterward as they would point to that hill and they would say, the true sacrifice is coming and that's where he'll be provided. See, here's my point with this. Genesis 22 should be read the way the whole Bible should be read. First and foremost, it's a biography. The Bible is a biography. It's the Holy Spirit's testimony to the Son. And when we see it that way, the entirety of Scripture, the entirety of Scripture comes into focus. So to, the key to this passage then is to ask the second question, who is Isaac? And here's the answer. He is Abraham's offspring. He is the immediate fulfillment of the cosmic promises that God has been making since he and, he and Abraham first met in Genesis 12. Let me show you. Genesis 12, beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Whoa. Did you catch that promise? Did you catch God's promise? The offspring of Abraham will save and bless the world. And God repeats this promise three more times. He repeats it in Genesis 12, 7, in Genesis 15, 5, and in Genesis 17, verses 4 through 8. Listen, I think that God repeats it three times because God might mean it and because it might be really important. In the meantime, though, in the meantime, the offspring of Abraham will be the nation of Israel, right? And in the long run, the offspring is Christ. Galatians 3.16 says that now Abraham and his seed, and now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as one, and to your seed who is Christ. But you see, in this first instance, before the Abrahamic people and before their Messiah, we get Isaac. We get Isaac. And can you picture, can you picture like baby Isaac, you know, he's in Abraham's arms, right? What do you have? Well, you have the hope of the world. You have no Isaac. You have no Israel. You have no Israel. You have no Christ. You have no Christ. You have no salvation. Whatever you do, Abraham, don't drop him. You know, I was once sharing this story with my favorite study buddy, uh, with my daughter Lily. And I was kind of sketching this picture, you know, layer by layer. I was kind of building this up. And here's what I told her. I said, Isaac is the only beloved son. I said, Isaac 
is the hope of the world. I said, Isaac is the source of all blessing. And then I challenged her to picture Isaac as he's trudging up that mountain with the wood on his back. And I asked her, I said, does that remind you of anything? I said, here's another clue. It's a hill near Jerusalem. Does that ring any bells? And suddenly, it was as if someone shocked her, you know, but only in a good way. And, and she started thumping me in the arm. I mean, she's thumping me in the arm as I sat next to her on the couch. I mean, just thumping me. And with this, you know, this kind of violence, it was like the light went on. It was this violence of pure joy. And she says, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. It's totally Jesus. And friends, here's what I want you to see. Instead of Genesis 22 becoming this insurmountable barrier to faith with Jesus at the center, it becomes an incredible boost to faith. And that essentially is why the whole Bible was written. It was written to make us say, hey, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's totally Jesus. And when we read scriptures like this, they start to make sense. So instead of Genesis 22 being an a, a, a insurmountable barrier to our faith with Jesus at the center, it becomes an incredible boost to our faith. Now, remember, Genesis 22 records an event two millennia before Christ was crucified. But from the beginning, the Bible has always been testifying to history's central event. Always. Let me try to tie this up in a neat package for you. You know, God didn't ask Abraham to go through with the sacrifice. But one dark Friday, God would provide The beloved son of the father would walk willingly up that hill, carrying the wood on his back. And there he would be slain to save and bless the world. See, if we attempt to read the Bible primarily as a rule book or as a moral guidebook, which requires absolute obedience, it crumbles between our fingers. See, with such a mindset, Genesis 22 is a scandal. It's a barrier to faith. Yet when Scripture is read as intended, we see it as a testimony to Christ. And suddenly we realize that all of the Bible and all believers of every age are fixed on this one truth that towers above all others. And this truth is stated so simply and so beautifully in the first chapter of John's Gospel in just 13 short words. Look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Only God the Father could offer God the Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And only God the Father would make that sacrifice. And only God the Son would be willing to suffer that anguish and agony. And friends, that's what love is. And that is God's redemptive plan for humanity and for his creation from the very beginning of time. That is God's solution to our need for salvation. Let me close with this. You know, I know that there are many of you here today who are seeking God's face. You're Christians. And I want to challenge you with just a few things. First, When you read God's word and come upon verses that offend your sensibilities, don't ignore them. When you read a scripture and think, how can this be? This doesn't seem consistent with who God is. Don't ignore it and move on. What I want to encourage you to do is roll up your sleeves and dive in. You see, God's character never changes. It never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if there is an inconsistency, it rests with you. And if you struggle through it, you will come to know God better than you ever thought possible. Friends, I won't lie to you. It's hard work, but it sure is worth it. Here's the second thing. I challenge you to ask yourself this. How deep is your faith? Do you know God well enough based on what the Bible teaches to trust him even when you do not have his perspective, even when you do not see the entire picture? Is your own personal experience of God enough to inspire you to venture into the unknown to bring glory to his name? And here's the third thing. Does your view of scripture revolve around Christ? When you read the Bible, do you see Jesus on every page? 
Do you realize that the entirety of the Bible, and in fact the entirety of human history, is God's plan of redemption unfolding? Do you realize that you have a part in God's plan to redeem this fallen creation? You have a part. And friend, you have a purpose. This is what I'm telling you. And if you know who you are in Christ, and only if you know who you are in Christ, can you achieve that purpose? Now, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then I'd like to pose this question to you. In whom or what do you place your faith? You see, we all have to place our faith in something, whether it's money, whether it's prestige, whether it's power, whether it's possessions, and none of those things last. Friend, if you're attempting to seek meaning in your life from any of those things, you're destined to be devastated. You're destined to be disappointed. Let me suggest something to you. You're not self-created. Your identity is not a product of your career or the balance in your bank account or your family name or your stuff. That's not where your identity comes from. Only your creator can provide you with meaning and purpose. And only when you know your purpose will you ever find joy and a sense of accomplishment. You were created by God for a purpose. Friends, God is worthy of your love and your trust. Come to Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it's your heart to reveal yourself to us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and a purpose for each of us. And we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to seek our own plan and purpose, but that it's, it's there for us if we just come and surrender to you. Father, I pray for all of my brothers and sisters here for your blessings over them in this coming week. I pray, Lord, that when uh, you reveal yourself to them in a deeper way, that you grow their faith. Um, I ask, Lord, for you to bless those who aren't here today. I pray, Lord, for you to bring revival to this community and this nation. And I pray for renewal in our churches. And all of that can only come as we humbly come to you seeking your face. Bless us, we pray. Father, I pray all of this in your name and for your glory. And in the name of your precious son, Jesus, amen. Second Timothy 2.13 says that if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And there's nothing that we can do or leave undone that's going to thwart the purposes of God. So let's stand together and, and praise his faithfulness to us. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great
the peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me amen let's say our benediction together the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks, you're dismissed.